Lalit bhai, we can start now. Yeah, thanks. So, good morning and welcome all the members of Bojuri Central CP Study Circle to this uh, uh, CP meeting, uh, which is for uh, on the subject of GST. That's key um, uh, key amendments uh, with effect from first January twenty twenty two, and the budget amendments. And we have with us the learned speaker C. Gauru Sava with us. And uh, uh, before we uh, start the proceeding, let us rise for the institute motion. यशस्सुप्तेशु जाग्रति यशस्सुप्तेशु जाग्रति कामं 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 कामुशो कुशो निर्मिमाना निर्मिमाना तदेव शुक्रम तदेव शुक्रदब्रह्मा तदब्रह्म Thank you. Uh, we are grateful to uh, see Gaurav Sawe that he agreed to take this particular session at very short notice, and we are thankful to see Dushan Bhat, our past convener as well, for coordinating with uh, Gaurav Gaurav ji. So, so may I now request C A Pratik Maru, our core committee member, to introduce the learned speaker. Thank you, Lalit Bhai. uh for giving me this opportunity to introduce uh, today's speaker uh see gaurav sabe is a fellow member of icai with uh, uh, 10 years of experience he is a qualified uh, company secretary he has uh, also successfully completed post qualification course of disa in june 2015 he has successfully completed concurrent audit uh, of banks forex and treasury management uh, forensic accounting and fraud prevention anti money laundering uh, all the courses from icai and he is currently the faculty with icai on the gs on the certificate course on gst since the launch of uh, gst since uh, uh, july 2012 is uh, gaurav is currently serving core group member of uh, bombay chartered accountant society in indirect tax committee corporate and commercial laws committee and seminar and public relations committee he is currently one of the convener in indirect tax laws in bcas and uh, he has also served the convener uh, of uh, shivaji park cp study circle uh, for the year 1920 he was nominated as national council of indirect tax committee in ashokam uh, he is also the faculty on the topics as uh, sandvet credit uh, with covering various entire substantive and uh, procedural gst law and uh, he has been the faculty with icai on the topic of statutory bank branch audit for the topics of lfar and iracc norm um he has uh, been leading uh, gaurav is leading the firm's taxation uh, team and mainly provides consultancy opinion and litigation services on critical matters and intricacies in uh, income tax and gst including cross border transaction he on behalf of the firm has given legal opinion to the scheduled cooperative bank in the matters relating to the erstwhile service tax and current gst he is a regular contributor uh, to bcas a uh, prestigious uh, uh, referencer and for continuously 5 years from 2017 18 he has been uh, contributing uh, even uh, till uh, 21 22 also for the current edition also he has uh, contributed on the topics of sandvet service tax profession tax mahavat gst uh, he has also written articles in service tax review thane branch of wrc uh, newsletter with this very brief introduction i welcome today's speaker uh, C A uh, Gaurav Sawe uh, on the Borivali uh, 
Study Circle platform. And as a token of uh, uh, appreciation, uh, we would like to share you uh, eMomento. Please acknowledge. Uh, please Thank you. Acknowledge. Thank you. Just it's all yours, uh, Gaurav. Um, I'll just uh, you can just share your screen. So before before Gauraji starts, just a small thing uh, that uh, it's a tradition of Burivali Central City Study Circle that we contribute uh, rupees five hundred towards the CABF on behalf of the speaker. So accept that as well, Gaurav. And stage is on those. We are we are eager to listen. To you. Thank you. In fact, uh, all of you sitting here, whether it is Lalit, Vijay Bhai, Pratik and even Dushyan Bhai, so it's real, or Nilesh also to that extent. It's difficult for me to say no. So there is nothing that I have joined for a very last moment. It's uh, all the friends are only here. So thank you for the opportunity today. And thank you Pratik for such a detailed uh, introduction. Yes, I uh, hope uh, I do justice to the topic. Uh, today's topic we are having is the changes which we have seen in GST which are effective on 1st January 2022 and again uh, Honorable Finance Minister had laid in her budget a lot of new further changes also. Now uh, most of the changes if we see which are effective from 1st January 2022 they were actually laid down in previous finance act so it took almost the rising of the next budget or the preparatory time of the next budget when they got effective nonetheless they will do it now also uh, we don't know the time but one thing is very clear from the government's point of view is that uh, they really do not want to keep any single loopholes actually uh, uh, what we are seeing or whatever is happening in gst is per se is more so because of the itc frauds which are coming up day in and day out we might be seeing a lot of the news about some thousand crores which are being defrauded by the people uh, in the industry, specifically for all these uh, fake invoices and all those things that are happening. But if you see at it as a percentage of the total uh, collections which they are doing and which the finance minister is placing on the floor of the house, that if they are doing such a high uh, percentage of recoveries of 1.4 million and all, then the percentage of frauds is actually not that much. So whether going so much stringent to carry on that 1% leakage to hold the industry for such a harsh uh, uh, provisions, is it true and or is it fair rather, uh, I think time only will tell. But yes, uh, this is the law of the land. Some of the provisions are notified and in force. So the only way to this is to maybe the industry or maybe some leaders in the industry who will challenge the uh, formation of the law someday or the other because slowly and steadily GST is moving out from the seamless credit or the main purpose that uh, the VAT based principles of the law are going away and away. So let's see how it is. I have not made a PPT presentation, but have made one uh, word file. I'll share this with the conveners also. Basically, being a budget session and being a study circle, I would want that let us have our focus on the change in the words which are taking place, like what exactly they are amending in the existing provisions, what is coming in the new provisions, and then uh, the small columns of effective date and all. So just one question, how would be the question answer? I don't mind taking it uh, together with the session. Uh, uh, session. So, so uh, it's up to you, you generally. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Lali, yeah. So generally what we do that we ask members to post their question in Q&A box. Right. And uh, whenever you are comfortable, you want to ah, So you can either questions. do that in the Q&A box. If anybody wants to even speak out, I think that should be fine. Uh, yes. If the... Uh, Organizers have no issues. I personally do not have any issue if they, it is interactive and if any questions come up uh, at that very point of time. No problem. So uh, we will take up those questions as well. If yes. uh, someone raises their hand, yes. then we will unmute them and ask yes. them to speak up. Yes, sure. yes, yes. And additionally, uh, there will be some views, uh, maybe because this is a budget session. So I thought I have to also share some 
aggressive views also which is normally expected out of a budget meeting but yes aggressive views come with a caveat that uh, the it will uh, you know the higher there is the higher the returns so if you want the higher returns then it will also be coupled with a uh, higher risk also so i will tell you what are the risk coupled and then this is the decision not per se of yours i would say whatever happens we are ultimately in the shoes of the uh, consultant you have to convey this to the client with whatever are the cons uh, which may come with it and uh, it is their decision finally which is implemented as a chartered accountant we have to harp on them again and again that it is their decision it is not our decision uh, because wherever i have interacted most of the times i have seen that uh, the cas do have taken the decisions on their head and they are under tremendous pressure of rectifying those things so one suggestion please don't do it you can suggest see ultimately it is a law law can have two different interpretations so if there is a aggressive decision just convey it right away and tell the businessmen however prudent they are to make their own hedgings for the final outcome if the outcome is in their favor it's a total win win for them but even if it is against them in the later stage it won't be a win lose situation so i'll just start my <coughs> screen share uh is the size proper yes it's just a word file uh recent changes and major budgetary amendments in gst uh first one a uh, very small one new insertion of uh, yeah new rule 10b has been inserted uh, this is basically to make the aadhar authentication for the registered persons so specifically if you see for the case of uh, huf the partnership kartas and all so they have made this uh, aadhar authentication also mandatory in rule 10b so uh, it can be used by them specifically for revocation of cancellations uh, then filing of refund applications and also refund under 89 as well as under 96 uh the respective notification i have given so you can always refer your 35 by 21 read with 38 by 21 and the effective date is 1122 the next one uh rule 453 again a smaller uh, change with effect from uh, 11021 in fact it has happened not exactly 11 but it was 110 so we knew that the details of challans in respect of goods uh, dispatched to job worker or received from a job worker were considered qua a quarter that is every quarter he would have to furnish a gst itc4 before the 25th day of the succeeding month succeeding the quarter that is 25th of july 25th of october so on and so forth now they have changed this frequency knowing that generally this is a uh, quite a tedious job plus this is more so to control the movement of the goods and not per se of any transfer of credits as such uh, in the, in totality the transfer does happen through your invoice only so hence the details of uh, chalan in respect of goods dispatched to job worker or received from a worker they have replaced the words during a quarter to during a specified period and the said quarter is been changed to said period so what is this specified period per se So for specified period, they have kept some uh, turnover criteria, wherein if the turnover exceeds whose turnover, the turnover of the principal, if it exceeds five crores, then the specified period is six months. That is first half April to September and second half October to March. This is the six monthly period. You will have to file ITC four twice. again after the end of uh, the 6 monthly period that is uh, 25th of october or 25th of april and if the turnover of the principal job worker turnover is not in concern if the turnover of the principal is less than uh, 5 cr then it falls under any other case so the whole specified period becomes a full financial year that is you will have to file itc 04 only once in a year so i hope now the compliance with itc 04 can increase very well because otherwise uh, we have seen that lot of people have actually forgotten to also file itc 04 regularly 
this has become effective from 1st of october so actually for one period it was uh, completed the next period now it will be due by 25th of april somebody has raised the hand no it seems by mistake someone is raised. okay 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 see then uh, uh, rule 59 c6 uh, uh, this was uh, the restriction on the electronic credit ledger to discharge a liability in excess of 90% and also that has been uh, deleted the rule itself so this was liability uh, towards tax in excess of 90% of uh, specifically in case of 86b that is the block credit so if your credits were getting blocked uh, by the department through the notice then they were not allowing you to uh, discharge the liability in excess of 90% they have simply removed it uh, the further changes will let us know uh, uh, what are the uh, current applications we have a new rule here 89a again this is uh, inserted with effect from 24921 but yet to be notified uh, this is in relation to refund so any person who is claiming refund under section 77 of the act of any tax paid by him in respect of transactions considered by him to be an intra state supply but which is subsequently a intra state supply that is section 77 we all know that uh, this is the re, uh, section wherein uh, you pay the tax under wrong heads or rather it's not simply paying under wrong heads but first considering the transaction to be a wrong head that is a transaction uh, say a typical example normally everybody has lot of doubts for uh, 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 this uh, intermediary services intermediary import service whether you will pay it as a igst or whether you will pay it as a cgst and sgst so multiple transactions or maybe even some 10 to b transactions are there so at times whether delivery terminates at your place who is taking it or it is given to the third party so some confusion between 10 to a and 10 to b may happen and that is where transaction may shift from uh, cgst sgst to igst or otherwise so uh, in this particular segment uh, the refund application they have been specifically uh, provided to the rules uh, the provisions were already there in the law but proper rules were not there so they have made that it can be done before the expiry of the period of 2 years from the date of payment of such tax right if you have paid that interstate tax then from that date of payment within 2 years you will have to file the rfp 01 now specifically that since this is going to come into force at a later date so whatever two years period which have been expired prior to that they all will start from the date it comes into force so for all the previous transactions till today wherein there was a misconception of considering the taxability it's not simply payment of tax your payment of tax you can shift through if the tax is lying in the cash ledger you can always shift through pmt 06 the uh, uh, heading of the the nature of tax but considering a transaction to be a cgst sgst to igst and if you are going to claim the refunds there then such transactions uh, you can always uh, claim within 2 years from the whenever this notification comes into force so, uh, sub rule sorry then we have some small changes or rather uh, you cannot say typically small because the quantum is increasing here but for section 120 and 130 in relation to detention of the goods uh, uh, and seizure of the goods and typically uh, where people have been facing a lot of issues when eva bills uh, are having some errors and goods are being uh, caught so the detention seizure of the goods in uh, existing clause 1a the penalty of which was equivalent to 100% of the tax payable has been increased to 200% so they want to make the law more and more stringent the rest all things that is or the value of uh, goods uh, uh, 2% of the value of goods or 25000 whichever is less so that is all, always considering uh their specific purpose here is they are delinking sections 129 and 130 that is confiscation and detention are being dealing and that is the reason they have been uh, brought this penalty here so either it it is indicative that it it is uh, they can go for either of the two and then release uh, at that period second detention seizure and release of goods in clause b on payment of applicable tax and penalty equal to 50% of the value of goods reduced by the tax paid thereon so uh, this valuation mechanism they have removed from uh, the penalty clause and they have 
straight away kept it it is either 50% of the value of goods or straight away 200% of the tax payable no no reductions nothing don't do a complicated calculations simply uh, consider 200% of tax or 50% of goods it's one is the value of goods the other penalty is on the tax whichever is higher uh, that would be the uh, amount of penalty which would be levied under 129 in case of confiscation uh, section 130 so uh, they have removed the notwithstanding uh, portion of the section and uh, it has been simply made as where any person so uh, this is it's to some extent uh, good that it is uh, getting restricted to this section and uh, it would be uh, read out the section would hence for be read out with the harmonious principles and not a overriding principle to uh, have no other recourse uh, left out section 132 second proviso is also ch changed uh, with the penalty equal to 100% of tax payable so which was earlier as uh, which was referred in 12991 so 12991 was here so here uh, it was 200% so any which ways it would land up to same but because that has been increased to now uh, 200% the confiscation penalty has been delinked and it has been made separately at 100% Uh, both of these again these are all uh, effective from 1122 and i have given the notification numbers there uh next comes the bit important one okay we all know uh, schedule 2 uh, included a item wherein the supply of goods classification schedule 2 is for classification of certain supplies whether they will be considered as supply of goods or supply of services and in which if the supply of goods by any unincorporated association or body of persons uh, to a member thereof for cash or deferred payment was done so it was been considered as supply of goods typically we know that this is in relation to the uh, cooperative housing societies where it matters most also the trade associations and all wherein the concept of mutuality was uh, very much prevalent uh, we had the kolkata high court kolkata kolkata club uh, decision also and it actually changed the dynamics of the mutuality in again the supply concepts so now this concept government is very clear that this is not the law what we are intending and for us uh, you both that is the there is no concept of mutuality per se is what they want to indicate here and that that the association or the cooperative society they are different from their members so instead of keeping it as a classification because we know that schedule 2 was typically only for classification any item coming in schedule 2 per se does not confirm that it is a supply uh, an an event or uh, action has to first fall under the definition of the supply then only your chargeability will come somewhere this link was missing and that is why a uh, new section uh, 71 aa was uh, inserted this was amended in last year's act uh, but notified very recently by 39 by 21 uh, in this december but the notification has been done with retrospective effect from the beginning of the law uh, uh, 17 i think i have missed out on the date uh, it is on 17 uh, 17 i'll just update it when i have to share this uh, uh, note to you all so supply now includes the activities or transactions by person other than individual to its members or constituents or vice versa for cash deferred payment or other valuable consideration so it is including all kinds of activities or transactions by a person other than an individual so this is very well or uh, uh, more enough uh, for the law to cover the transactions which are been provided or the services uh, which are been provided now why we are saying it services because for gst law both of them are different maybe even in our cooperative law and otherwise we say that it is ultimately the self service or the self supply there is no separate person right but in this uh, context if, if you say that activities or transactions by a person other than individual to its member or constituents or vice versa for cash deferred payment or other valuable consideration 
for purpose of this clause it is hereby clarified that notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for timing in force or judgment or decree or order of court or authority person and its members or constituents shall be deemed to be two separate persons and the supply of activities or transactions inter se shall be deemed to take place from one such person to another such person now the definition although they want to open up uh, more for the associations and all but uh, keeping it more open activities of trans by a person other than an individual to its members or constituents can have a lot of other ramifications now whether a partnership will be getting covered in this the answer from my side would be no because partnership per se will have partners and to consider partners as members or constituents would be a different part uh, the the trade terminology partners have a certain uh, other responsibilities also which are to be furnished so to that extent we can still consider that a partner and partnership are still different and any supply which happens between the partner and partnership should not get hit by section 7188 any question so far or shall i move ahead you can move ahead yes okay so uh, the next one is uh, the amendment to section 161b of igst so this is supply of goods or service both to uh, says developer or says economic unit so they have added the words for authorized operations uh now here also it is uh, important to note that in lot of the activities which we have found that have, when it was restricted to supply of goods or services to the says developer or says economic zone unit itself uh some bar was getting created in the free flow of transaction one such example i can give it is in relation to the ftwz the free trade warehousing zone which is also scz uh, as mentioned in scz act in fact if you see all the permissions what you get for the ftw said you simply get it as nominated as a special economic zone itself the author the operations are authorized so the free trade between the parties who are keeping their goods in that zone uh, as a example here now they are per se not a sales developer neither are they a sales unit also because you are simply keeping your goods in the warehouse there right now when the transactions of free trade is happening uh, there were challenges which were being faced uh, by the uh, member or by so by the trade that uh, such transactions were getting challenged by the department in show cause notices and now executing a free trade is one of the authorized operations as uh, which is in line with the foreign trade policy also so to make those things simpler they have added here for authorized operation although this is a prospective amendment from 1122 but for the period prior to that we can always feel that uh, when such amendments which come clarificatory in nature because this is uh, clarifying the intent of the law then we can always uh, rely on the delhi high court's uh, vatika township uh, ruling and uh, it does say that such uh, clarificatory amendments uh, which are clarifying the intent and content of the law then they can be construed to be a retrospective so to that extent uh, 161b is a welcome change and which is being made effective from 1122 in 163 uh, the existing section has also undergone a change the existing section said that a registered person making zero rated supply shall be eligible to claim the refund under either of the following options namely he may supply goods or service or both under lut and uh, to such condition safeguards and procedures as may be prescribed without payment of igst or he may also supply a uh, good service both subject to the condition safeguards and procedures on payment of igst or both of course in accordance with the section 54 of the cgst act so this whole subsection 3 has been replaced with subsection 3 a new subsection 3 in having its own provisions and uh, subsection 4 to that extent the substituted subsection 3 for section 16 says that a registered person making zero rated supply shall be eligible to claim the refund of unutilized itc on supply of goods or service or both without payment of itc under bond or lut in accordance with section 54 as 
uh, subject to the conditions and safeguards as may be prescribed. So the proviso says that registered person making uh, such zero rated supply shall, in case of non realization of sales proceed, be liable to deposit the refund so received under this subsection along with applicable interest under section 50 of CGST Act after the within 30 days after the expiry of time limit prescribed under FEMA for receipt of foreign exchange remittance in such manner as may be prescribed. So till date, uh, it is also bringing in some level of clarity because we know that uh, supply of service per se, if we say that supply of services are being uh, 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 completed only and only when there is a receipt of money in foreign currency. There are some specified countries wherein Indian rupees have been allowed specifically in some Middle Eastern countries and we know that it is in relation to Nepal. Uh, I think the sound is uh, near me because uh, in the building next to where I am sitting, uh, there is some construction activity going on. I am sorry for that. So, but I, my, uh, it's okay, uh, but we yeah, can hear yeah. you. Your properly. voice is very clear. Okay. Yeah. okay. That, that should be. So, uh, since the service supply is not completed, uh, service supply is not completed, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, means till the, uh, uh, sorry, export of service supply is not completed till, uh, your receipts uh, in foreign exchange are received or as notified. So wherever it is notified by the government that with such countries, uh, even if the money or the proceeds can be received in uh, Indian rupees, that should be fine. That will still be considered here as uh, a part of uh, compliance of this section. So to bring in parity with that section, uh, they are allowing that uh, generally we know that the time limit is 180 days for the realization of debtors under FEMA and RBI mandates for such realization. So if such realization is not happening in foreign exchange, then uh, what they are saying that they have to uh, make this refund. Now, this is typically now adding one more condition per se for uh, uh, the supply of goods. Okay. Now, supply of service, we know it is dependent upon the foreign currency. But as far as supply of goods is concerned, the export is complete the moment the goods are uh, moving outside the country. Once the goods are crossing the customs frontier, the export is complete from our side. There is no second thought process that there is uh, no export. Realization of foreign currency is an important aspect. Yes. But to lay such a condition here uh, would actually be a deterrent for the trade. So uh, specifically for goods, uh, people will have to take care now that their realizations also should happen as far as the FEMA time limits are concerned. And else the refund so received will always be uh, have to be uh, refunded back to the government uh, with uh, applicable interest. There is a subsection 4 which also says that uh, government may on recommendation subject to uh, that a class of person who may make zero rated supply on payment of IGST and claim the refund of tax open and a class of goods or service which may be exported on the payment of IGST and supplier of such goods or may claim the refund of tax open. So this is a place where you can uh, find that hopefully the regular notify the this applicability would be for certain, uh, uh, you can say, uh, the threshold limits and uh, for the general trade, it won't have much of a problem. The most important uh, section which all of us uh, must have actually had some hands on by now, and uh, this is a newly inserted section of section 16.2.AA. Now, 16.2.AA has a lot of ramifications also. Uh, this is a law. This is a notified law and this is a law in force as on date. We all knew that 16, section 16 had certain conditions uh, which were strongly been put up by all of us uh, when it is a question of uh, claiming the credit. We always were with the loggerheads with the department specifically for matching the 2A. The 2A was so much dynamic that even when we used to find it twice, it would be different 
what way which you are realize re, uh, relying on the two way which is automatically populated in the gst9 and the two way which has been referred by the department in the various uh, scrutiny notices and the show cause notices they are all together different it becomes a nightmare to simply uh, go on matching all of those things if we per se go for section 16 uh, we know that there were four conditions which are primarily to be satisfied on the basis of which uh, uh one can claim the credit the first one was that the uh, recipient has to be in possession of the tax invoice or the debit note the second he should have received the goods and services third one was uh, subject to 41 or 43a i'll speak about it later on uh the tax charge in respect of such supply was actually paid and fourth he has furnished the return under 39 so here he means the inputs uh, provided for per se uh uh okay so now 41 and 43a 43a actually never saw the light of the day it was uh, uh inserted earlier by the uh, budgetary amendment only but was never notified section 41 is uh, as regards to your provisional credits which were there now that has also undergone a change but having said so if you are doing a transaction in a true genuine sense wherein uh, there is a supply for which the goods and or services have been received by the recipient further uh, there is a proper invoice invoice is the document uh, through which you will be actually be able to claim the credit whether it is the tax invoice whether it is the debit note if it is satisfying the provisions of law having all the necessary disclosures that was enough the third uh, condition per se was that uh, the other person that is the supplier has to pay the tax now this is typically a such a condition wherein uh, you know it was laid down in a most idealistic situation wherein you are having the powers in section 39 the uh, supplier of files is outward supply it would get reflected in uh, itr uh, sorry gstr uh, 2a of the recipient he he would get another time of 5 days to file his inward supplies and okay he could modify he could edit he could delete those details and carry on now in today's that scenario my section or in fact till even the uh, budget gets passed this section 30 is still in force now section 38 being in force uh, for section 38 being in force uh, we still have a statutory right to claim my substantive right of uh, gst now if that has been taken over uh, where where do i per se uh, stand in this uh, uh, where do i per se stand so there is no legal right second uh, payment of tax what i can ensure with my supplier is that i can pay him in time if i don't pay him in that 180 days period i will have to reverse my credit that is the maximum which i can do i cannot go into the portal of my supplier and make sure whether the tax on my particular transaction has been paid unlike tds there is no such provision wherein you link a chalan to uh, a specific transaction in tds we know that we pay the chalan and in the tds return the uh, income tax tds return the payment paid chalan is getting linked with every transaction no such thing is happening here in gst or moment when you say that it is been filed in somebody gstr what because one and three are different had it had it been one single statement this mapping would have done now in 3b we know currently they have made this provision of tax whether you are paying for this period or a previous period circular 26 by 26 by 2017 dated 29 december 17 was be available long back which was telling you that if you have done any mistakes in 3b or missed out something you can adjust those things in the subsequent 3b till the expiry of the due date of september of the immediate next financial year now having all those laws today's day we all had a lot of messed up 3b's right now in in this situation nobody can actually say that the tb which has been filed what as a recipient i can maximum do is i can go on the portal and check the filing table of that person further there there are provisions for the gst ratings for the suppliers now that also was never in force government never intimated me whether my supplier was uh, 
uh, not a non-performer or he was a bad in law and all those things. So all these idealistic things were not there. My substantive right to claim the refunds are still available in the law, yet I was denied the credit. So they brought in that rule 36.4. After having brought in that rule 36.4, uh, they brought those uh, 20%, 10% and 5%. Now having said so again, the rule has to be backed by law. So to back that uh, rule to restrict your credit, they are saying that the details of invoice or debit note referred to in clause A has been furnished by supplier in the statement of outward supply and such details have been communicated to recipient of invoice or debit note in manner specified in 37. Now, this actually gives them power to make uh, GSTR to be more important. It is a part of law now that the details have to be furnished by the supplier it has to get reflected, communicated to the recipient is how. It is of course through uh, the communication through the portal, uh, which is in GSTR 2, uh, 2B. And if that communication is satisfied, that is the only time wherein you can actually claim the credit. But will there be certain other changes or certain other factors which uh, will actually have issues? Like take the case of imports. At times, we know that in today's date also, import credit, the credit for uh, paying IGST, when the goods are removed through bill of entry, you are holding a valid bill of entry in your hand, but uh, two, two, three, three months or even more than that, we have found that people are getting a time lag uh, when the details are not uploaded. The details may not be uploaded because of some mistakes in GST number or some other smaller errors, which we don't know. And generally at this level, we are actually not involved in those aspects. So you will have to coordinate with your CHA agent you have to ask for an appropriate matching of the IESK data and bill of entries. So because it is a law, even though the other department is of the government itself, the money is lying with the government, you are having the valid documents, but if it is not getting reflected, you will per se be questioned for claiming the credit in 16 AA if it is not reflected. Beyond 2B, what is reflected in your 2B, can you have uh, amounts which are uh, in relation to the previous period? The answer is yes. You can always claim those things. There shouldn't be any problem for claiming the credits which are, uh, in, uh, which are related to previous period. And if you are in the regular time limit, then you can very well claim those credits and go forward. These credits will not get reflected in your current 2B. But as a matter of check, what we can do is we can always have a cumulative check of QB for uh, two periods in, in totality. So what I mean by cumulative period, suppose say any transaction uh, which was supposed to be or a credit which was supposed to be claimed in the month of December or October. Now at that time you have saw, uh, you have seen the to be it was not reflecting, so you have not taken. When you come for the month of uh, February, you are take uh, you are finding it in your uh, 2B. So can you take it? Yes, because even though it is not uh, related to the current period, you can always take it to the uh, time at uh, when it is being uh, reflected. The most important aspect here, what uh, I would say, it is a bit of an aggressive stand also. But uh, just excuse me for a moment. So a uh, bit of an aggressive stand, which uh, I would like to highlight that we all generally say that the time limit to claim the credit is uh, uh, the due date of September return. Or now uh, what we will see ahead uh, is the due date of uh, uh, due date of September return or now what has been extended to 30th of uh, November. But what is the indication here of the members? Is it is it simply restricted to that or is there something in the law wherein you can actually claim the credits beyond September also? Is there any legal proposition? Anybody would want to speak on this? How have we read the law so far or how have we interpreted it? Anyone, you can put it in chat box also. I'll give you just two minutes to think.
I'll just do this. Yes, any views? Is there is there a way out? Can we claim at least yes, no? Till November, okay, that is amended. Way quota strictly in favor of it will be difficult. Yes, it will be difficult, but isn't it our uh, isn't it our responsibility to make the law mature? If we if we simply accept it, what the parliament has made it, uh, of course they have the rights. We have elected the representatives there. They have the rights, but don't we also have a fundamental right to have a free and fair business in uh, this state, right? Claim credit, reverse it, then on actual basis. Okay, on what lines are we going to reverse it? Just because it is not reflecting in two B. Is it so? I would just want to highlight. Uh, is this taxman screen available? Yes, we can see that. Yes, you can see that. See, I wanted to highlight certain points. Uh, why? Uh, a certain language per se. See, we all know that this time limit is not given in section 16. Section 16 is simply speaking about the eligibility of the credit. The, in fact, the heading of the uh, section is also eligibility and conditions for taking the credit. Right. So if it is if it is sets down the conditions that if you are uh, uh, satisfying A, B, C, D, tick mark 1, 2, 3, 4, all are satisfied, you are eligible to take the credit. Now, uh, before coming to 39, let us see there is section 35. What is 35 saying? Every registered person shall keep and maintain at his principal place of business a certificate, true and correct account of production, inward, outward stock, input credit availed. This clearly mandates that you have to maintain a ledger of input credit avail, a true and correct uh, record. And if, if it is maintained and as a part of your books of accounts and which I guess uh, there is there won't be any person who is not maintaining this uh, account per se, then your availment of credit does satisfy. Because read 35 with section 16, a harmonious construction, you are eligible to take the credit. Are you availing it? Yes. Now, this conditions of 39, what we are saying regularly or uh, uh, due date of September or now what will be extended there. What is this saying? Provided no such rectification or omission, no such rectification or omission of incorrect particulars, no such rectification or omission of incorrect particulars. I'm repeating, rectification of omission of incorrect particular. What it is saying, rectification of omission or incorrect particular will be allowed beyond 30th. Okay. Now, what it is saying that no such rectification would be allowed. Right. What happens if you have to claim the credit for the first time? You have claimed it in your books of accounts, right? You have claimed it in the books of accounts. You are availed it. You have an issue with your 2B instead of simply doing away with it you can always keep it there is one option the most uh, conservative option is that uh, if it is not getting in the reflecting in your 2b by the time you are closing your books or by this uh, statutory due date which has been mentioned you can simply do away with it but otherwise if you go everywhere whether it is 39 37 and all you have one statutory right wherein you can always make. of course now with the new 38 that right will also be gone but till the previous period, till 1122 uh, or prior, or rather till these budget provisions are coming into effect, okay? Till that time, you are having a statutory right wherein you are allowed to intimate to the other party that this is the credit which I have taken. This is what is my legal stand. 
Now, if that is not there, and for any reason, if you are not taken the credit which is not reflecting in your two A, and that is a legal valid credit, then what you are not allowed is only not to do such rectification of omission or incorrect uh, particulars, which are uh, which shall be allowed after the due date. For claiming the credit for the very first time, for claiming the credit for very first time, they have actually not given such a view that the credit is getting lost. Okay, so one may say that yes, the term here given is omission of particulars also, right? But omission of particulars uh, uh, may not may not only be uh, related uh, to the extent of uh, what do you say? May not only be related to the extent uh, uh, they are, they are being left out from filing in the returns because what and how we have to account has been given in section number thirty five. And in 35, you are maintaining a proper ITC ledger, ITC availed ledger, right? So in that case, in an aggressive stand, if you have a mismatch with your 2B, by whatever uh, length, if the uh, uh, the supplier is filing late, yes, there is one more thing which I would like to point out. And in 2Bs, all of us must have observed that uh, we get one option there that credit is not available because the supplier has filed his return late. Now, supplier filing his return in time or not in time does not affect my eligibility. My eligibility is very clear. I should possess the invoice. I should have received the goods or services. The tax on that has to be paid and I have furnished the return under 39. So, I have if I have furnished the return under 39 in time, the tax has been paid will be justified even if he is paying later the tax the justification of tax paid is happening and there are ample of case laws which say that no transaction can be taxed twice you cannot recover the same amount from the supplier you cannot also recover the same amount from the uh, buyer also right it is either of the two which has to be and this the second part recovery of such uh, taxes from the buyer would be at a very uh, you know last uh, last resort the department is having the details of all the suppliers they are there on record to you so the first job of the department would be to be and go to go and snatch the supplier they have to recover from his property they have to invoke all the sessions. simply restricting the credit won't suffice so in this particular scenario all these transactions where the supplier has filed it late, he has filed with the wrong GSTN and that is the reason it is not reflecting, his time limit to do the corrections have gone and all those aspects are there. Your right to claim the credit does not go away. So yes, as a prudent businessman to avoid continuous litigation, you can account for all such mismatch credit separately and take a conscious call when you want to claim it for the very first time. So if you want to take the credit for the first time, because what restrictions are being created are the restrictions on the rectifications. The restrictions are not on the claiming of the credit. Claiming of the credit can happen uh, sign a die. Uh, that is what I would feel. But yes, this is a matter which will go with litigation. In fact, somebody has yes said here that uh, we are of the view that IGST do not expire and always I will prefer to always take reverse it before the due date and read credit it. Yes, this is also one of uh, better solutions wherein you take it, you reverse it at the time or this you will have to then if you are following this situation which is uh, comparatively yes it would be litigative but comparatively less litigative so in that case what you will have to do is you will have to take and account for it every time and every time it gets reflected in your 2b you have to take it but all the mistakes of the supplier need not be passed on to you i think i read somewhere that uh, government will rectify yes the issue is the same that today we may take such a stand the courts may uh, agree to it also but the government tomorrow can actually retrospectively change the law so that is one caveat which will always follow uh, with claiming of such credit but again i am repeating uh, mistakes done by the supplier and he cannot rectify it he has filed his gstr one late should not debar your credit
filing of return is on the recipient to claim the credit 16.4 to take the credit he has furnished the return that eligibility comes in section 16.4 so when you are taking it to your electronic credit ledger and if we read the language again then it says that he shall be entitled to the credit and it will be credited to the credit ledger okay so this should not debar your uh, prospects and uh, yeah so reclaim of reverse credit can be done this will not get reflected what will happen that if you go beyond their tolerable margins any which ways we come to know that the figures turn red so in all such situation uh, we will have to be ready with the reconciliations and all our explanations and everything will have to be uh, uh, informed to them second will this be effective this provision 16.2 a that is restricting your credit to 2b will this be applicable with effect from 1st january or even if for the past periods if you are filing the returns late uh, per se the language is open uh, i would say that when language is open every time we should not go for the benefits accruing to the assessee and the taxable person uh, department will always say that since you are filing it at later stage, you will have to, you are claiming the credit today, you will have to compare that with GSTR 2B as on date, what is reflecting in your portal and accordingly you will have to file. So this aspect will also be, have to be taken care of. This is generally applicable for forward charges. So all your reverse charge transactions should not be affected. Although import IGST is also a reverse charge, but it is specifically, uh, highlighted there so you have to go with that and the only solutions which we are having currently which are less litigative that would be to have a continuous follow-up with your vendor so that the correct details are captured and these follow-ups have to be done timely they they should not be done at a later fag end stage uh, when you are actually running out of the uh, time to complete your compliance there will be credit notes cumulative uh, down uh, so, uh, so credit notes will also be reflected in between so those things you will have to take care of the reversals in those aspects will have to be subtracted specifically if they are pertaining to any previous period so the best solution here would be to have a cumulative download and uh, compare your to be with your books of accounts on cumulative basis and uh, you can remove from that uh, most of the people I have also seen that uh, because there is really paucity of time on checking with the credits, they simply take the figures which are available in 2B and put it in their 3B. Uh, you may avoid that also. Uh, of course, in very stringent times, yes, uh, you can do it, but you may avoid that. And instead, uh, specifically, if you have the list of your block credits, then make sure that such block credits are also removed because 2B is a statement which will reflect your block credits also, which will reflect your late credits also. And some of them are under assumptions. Some are not in the direct assumptions, but you understand from your side that whether if any item is falling under section 17.5, like say example, gifts for free samples. Now, again, that is a very different and vast term. What do you call as gift, whether you take it as gift or whether you take it as a expenditure or a marketing expenditure or brand building exercise, these are all different aspects. But per se, if you have classified in your books of account that this is going to be a block credit and it is getting reflected in your 2B, you should uh, very well uh, reduce that amount. Wrong invoices or interstate numbers. Like in case of multiple numbers, we have also seen that uh, instead of uh, the invoice being raised on uh, Gujarat unit, it might have been used on Maharashtra. So it will get reflected in 2B of Maharashtra. It will be a shortfall in the 2B of Gujarat. So uh, that doesn't really mean that Maharashtra should take the credit. You will have to verify whether all the 2B credits are uh, actually been pertaining to uh, your period. The so same uh, about the deferred credits. Uh, I had said that the best solution would be you may not write it off immediately or the most conservative stand park this credit in a separate account in your uh, books of accounts. You claim them correctly as one of the sir has explained that you take the credit and reverse it so i think taking and reversing at the same time would also help you 
because there is some change in uh, interest also now and it is a good welcome change uh, clarificatory change so going most uh, conservative you can claim the credit and reverse it in some uh, same period park it in separate account whenever it gets reflected in your 2b you can claim it because there is no time limit per se for uh, claiming such credits and uh, uh, in this transition the uh, the stand which i would take is that post 1st january 2022 you apply the to be throughout you apply the to be throughout even if you are filing the previous periods returns are you allowed to change the figures yes you are allowed to change the figures but uh, you have to be ready with all your reconciliations because the time limit in which you will get the notice wouldn't be a huge time limit so once they send they uh, send you a very small short duration of 7 days or uh, sometimes even lesser also so if such short duration uh, notice has been sent to you you will have to reply what is your justification of taking credits which are beyond 2b again i am saying if you have to take aggressive stand yes you can but you should be well prepared for that there is no point in simply taking a aggressive stand without doing any uh preparations of your compliance and back end reconciliation something in the chat uh, okay can we take genuine itc not reflecting in 2b to electronic credit but we will not use it till it reflects in 2b to match with the books of post accounts so yes according to me uh, you can very well take and keep it uh, there and you do not use it but the only part is that you know that non utilization because once a credit comes in a common pool uh, it really cannot be identified separately we have a lot of judgments in selvat uh, also that a credit uh, loses its identity once it comes into the common pool so keeping it availed on the portal if you have to avail it the best option would be to keep it availed in your books of accounts or else if you are taking it on the portal in your uh, electronic credit ledger as one of the participant here had suggested you take it you reverse it there as not reflecting in 2b because reasons of reversals can be multiple and once it is reversed on your portal you can again park it under mismatch credits you can create a separate ledger head mismatch credits mismatch valid credits whatever name you want to keep uh, you can uh, keep it accordingly in your books of accounts and claim it at the appropriate time whenever it gets reflected uh fortunately the uh, section for section 50 in fact i immediately i think i should go to that because uh, that is in link with this see 53 okay it has been amended a taxable person who makes an undue or excess claim of itc uh, under 4210 or undue or excess reduction in output tax shall pay interest now these terms were very harsh undue and excess claim now they have changed that to has been uh, itc has been wrongly availed and the most important part is utilized it has been wrongly availed and utilized so what you are saying is so far you are not utilizing it it's fine so one one proposition of saying non utilization is you are taking it in your credit ledger keep it in keeping it in there and not at all utilizing it throughout issue can come at a place when the department suomoto takes away your credit so if you keep that amount parked in your credit ledger in some of the cases where the department suomoto uh, debits that amount and uh, takes it as a utilization without your consent also because the government has powers your credit will get utilization so you will land up in a separate uh, litigation so the better way would be you take the credit you reverse it keep it parked in your uh, books of accounts and reclaim it so that can be a easier stand and uh, which you can always uh, uh, have a good case to fight at a later stage i'll come back here uh, there are some few questions let me just have a look at it uh, what is the maximum hardship in claiming so maximum hardship is that this is a law of land they will always say that you have claimed the credit more than what is due to you that is one part 
the moment they say it is more than what is due to you then it will be followed by interest also it will be followed by penalty also as a general clause uh, being not specified if dealer has claimed itc of one invoice in 3b but it is reflected in 2b of february what are the uh, you mean to say it has been uh, uh, claimed in the month of january and reflected in 2b of february mr shah vaibhav shah if dealer has claimed it is of one invoice in 3b but it is reflected in 2b of february so i assume that this is claimed in january and it is reflected in the month of february that is the next month so yes uh, they they may uh, they will in fact send you a notice for interest but again uh, because section 162aa is in force now see what is it saying that details of invoice so this is a additional condition for your eligibility which they have been putting now that the details of invoice or debit note referred to in clause a has been furnished by supplier in the statement of outward supply and such details have been communicated so by that time when you are taking in your credit ledger the details were actually not communicated to you right they were not furnished they were not communicated to you right so because of that reason uh, they will say that your eligibility one of the condition is not been satisfied and because it is not satisfied then it becomes a undue claim and that is the reason i was suggesting that you park these things in your books of accounts you claim at a later stage i don't think there should be any bar for you to claiming the credit for the first time in your portal at a later stage what you have to take care is that you have to park the account properly or account for it properly in your books of accounts when your conditions which are under your control we know that the taxation laws are also governed by various uh, principles uh, one of it is doctrine of impossibility of performance the supplier filing his gst return and paying the tax is totally out of my control it will never happen it can happen only and only in the case when i as a recipient will instead of paying him the gst amount i will pay directly to the portal in his that is a reverse statement i am filing i am filing all the input taxes which i have to pay of the registered persons through my return only only in only that situation i have a control otherwise it is completely governed by the doctrine of the impossibility of performance the moment it is held then yes you will have to go through a court matter this will not happen at the litigation stage at the uh, departments level that is neither at commissioner appeals and maybe at itat but again itat won't comment on it because it is a fact finding authority it will say that you will have to go to the high court for interpreting how the law is this is one of the interpretation i have also given it is not a law of land ultimately the interpretation of law will come from the high court okay so safer stands would be claim it in your books of accounts don't face a otherwise if anywhere see speaking from here is easier to go for the safer stand and all but we all know that businesses are really struggling with lot of cash flow issues also so they do force us to take the credit but whatever said and done they will have to make sure that it is their responsibility you can give them this best possible solutions available in the best possible manner how you can claim the credit but otherwise if one wants to go aggressive he has to be ready with the litigation also okay uh, what if we avail but not utilize and how would you prove that so this i have already answered the better way would be take uh, reverse and park it in your books of accounts one state gst uh, appearing in another state due to error this also i have said so make sure that uh, you will have to get the rectifications done at the best possible time uh, explain the burden of tax not passed on amounting to unjust enrichment yes so burden of tax uh, uh, see so unjust enrichment is again the same that uh, you are not paying it right you are recovering it from the other person also and you are claiming the refund so uh, uh, no transaction could have a double benefit it is a benefit can be claimed once like if you are claiming the credit and expensing it out also that won't suffice because that is also uh, leading to unjust enrichment so we'll have to uh, avoid these things 
we have received asmt 10 for a specific case i will just take later for paying the difference between 2a 3b we have claimed uh, less itc as compared to 8a we have explained to department i think this is a specific case i will just take it in the end uh, i don't mind any uh, claimed but not utilized whether interest payable no uh, the new amendment in 53 which i just covered that unclaimed and unutilized uh, would not uh, lead to uh, interest under 53 coming back here uh, i think for 16 2 a uh, just a quick revisions uh, items like you may have differences when your imports your previous period items which will be not may not be reflected in your 2b so you can claim them reclaim of credits will never be reflected in 2b you can always reclaim such credits uh, this will be applicable for all returns which are filed post 1st january uh, generally applicable for forward charge that is reverse charge won't generally get reflected in your 2b credit notes and cumulative downloads uh, credit notes giving the effects of credit notes has to be taken care of cumulative downloads uh, for your proper reconciliations specifically when you are taking credits beyond the current period uh block credits uh, as i have already explained that you should remove uh, voluntarily also simply taking the figures of 2b will not suffice wrong invoice or of the interest rate numbers uh, uh that matter also the corrections have to be taken care of you will have to follow up and get the corrections done by that time now here one more factor we know that once the corrections are done okay once the corrections are done um it is uh you know bound to come to that date now the only thing is that corrections will get reflected in 2b at a later stage 2a will come at the previous stage but 2b will get reflected at a later stage now 16 to double a goes to your 2b so again a prudent stand would be take the credit when it is reflecting in your 2b if not if not again this is a point where the department may go because today's day department has very limited areas of increasing the tax base so they are actually going for every every smallest of the place where uh, they can actually go and fight out for the credit or deny the credits okay uh, the newly inserted section with 16 to ab for finance act 22 in the current budget that details of itc in respect of the said supply communicated to registered person under 38 has not been restricted so now we will have to also follow this condition that to be does not voluntarily restrict the credits okay now so far uh, we were doing uh, at the above stage it was simply to the extent it is reflecting in to be you should take or you should not take further now they are saying that it should not be restricted by uh, uh, the to be so in respect of said supply communicated to registered person under 38 it has not been restricted the moment it is a restricted credit again now this is a condition to you the eligibility to claim the credit so so far the law is in force henceforth it will be a restriction on your credit so for all these mismatch credits we'll have to make sure that we take the accounting uh, in the most prudent form and accounting happens properly okay uh section 41 claim of itc every registered person shall subject to conditions and restrictions uh will be allowed for self-assessed uh, eligible itc as a self-assessed it is re uh, written and such amount shall be credited on provisional basis now we know 41 was there uh per se to facilitate uh, GSTR 1, 2 and then the 3. So the concept was that even if there is any mismatch in this current month when we are holding the invoice, when we are holding the, uh, uh, when we are uh, in the possession of the goods and services, we have received them. In this month, you can take the credit and after this month's return are filed by both the parties, the mismatch will be communicated to both of them you get a chance to rectify that by the end of the next month if it doesn't happen then in the third month the one who has taken the credit will be asked to reverse the other person will be asked to justify okay whenever the supplier then rectifies his stand then the recipient can again take the credit this was the reason for taking provisional credit 
Second, where provisional credit was helping you is that because of this facilitation only, in the reverse charge mechanism, when we are uh, discharging the tax, we are claiming the credit in the same tax period because that is the credit which is claimed on provisional basis. Because unless and until my GSTR 3B is not filed, my discharge of liability is not happening. It is not taking place. So section 41 was here to help you out and it was facilitating your credits. Now this provisional basis, uh, they, are, uh, they have removed it. They are stating that every registered person shall subject to such conditions, restrictions as be entitled to avail the credit of eligible ITC. So eligible ITC, you will have to read with section 16 and all the newly laid conditions as self-assessed in his return and such amount shall be credited to his electronic credit ledger. So now here they are even giving this the color of the self-assessment instead of taking it as provisional. It was difficult for them to levy penalties on the provisional basis. So the moment it is self-assessed, the assessment of it has been done. And any, uh, uh, you know, any conditions which you are not satisfying. So that is how they are empowering also section 6 to double A and AB. Okay. Then the ITC availed by registered person in subsection 1 in respect of such supplies of goods or service, the tax payable whereon has been paid by the supplier shall be reversed along with the applicable interest in such manner as may be prescribed. So if the tax has not been paid by supplier, then they will have to reverse the credit also. So uh, this also they are providing here uh, that uh, if there is no tax payment happening on the taxes paid, then they can reverse it. So with this stand, if you harmoniously read uh, subsection one and two, the substituted one says that you shall be subject to conditions and restrictions entitled to avail the credit of eligible ITC as self-assessed in your return, it shall be credited to your electronic credit ledger. Subsection 2 says credit of ITC availed by the registered person under 1, that is as self-assessed as above, in the respect of such supplies or goods or both, the tax payable whereon has not been paid by the supplier shall be reversed along with applicable interest by the said person in such manner as may be prescribed, provided that where said supplier makes the payment in respect of aforesaid supplies, the said registered person may reavail the amount of credit reversed by him in such manner as may be prescribed. So they are indeed suggesting you that you take the credit, you reverse it, and then reclaim whenever it is happening. It is bringing in a lot of clarity, but the issue of September or November will still be haunted by the department, wherein I have given my stand that for the first time, whenever you are claiming the credit, it shouldn't be a problem. So you claim the credit and any which ways we also know that uh, the reclaim actually does not have any time limit. Second, 2B will always restrict your credit if it is if the invoice is filed beyond September or beyond 30th of November in the uh, current scenarios. If the uh, invoice is filed by the sub, uh, supplier beyond 30th of November, 2B will restrict your credit. But that condition is not been a condition for your reclaim of credit. So you can very well take the credit, reverse it, park it out separately in your books of accounts. Let these figures get audited properly. If, uh, if you follow these procedures, I think your stand would be much, much simpler. There will be a delay in your cash flow for utilization, yes, no doubt in that, but this would be a safer stand. If beyond that anybody wants, then they will actually have to litigate much further and uh, claim the credit at the simple state. So like one of the person had suggested here that we will keep it parked in our electronic credit ledger itself. So you keep it parked in your electronic credit ledger only, proving that non availment would be difficult. Second, generally in credit ledgers, uh, there has always been the assumption that the credits, as I said, that once it is in common pool, it is unidentified. The moment it is unidentified, it will always be assumed to be the first in first out reduction. So first in first out will some or the other point of time make that uh, may, make, a, uh, make a situation that your credit has not only been availed, but it is also utilized. So you will again be penalized. Section 53 will get invoked. 
So to avoid that, take the credit, reverse the credit, park it separately in your books of accounts and reclaim whenever it comes, uh, whenever it becomes due to you. Section 42 has been omitted. 43, 43A has also been omitted. In fact, 43A never saw the light of the day. Uh, section 38 has been replaced in totality. Uh, the new 38 specifically, if we see, uh, uh, or if we see in 38 also provided that no rectification of error or omission in respect of details furnished under subsection 2 shall be allowed. Now, subsection 2 was in relation to Uh, subsection 2 was in relation to other than a ISD uh, filing of uh, the details of inward supplies which were to be filed on the uh, reverse charge basis. Sorry. Including inward supplies of goods on which tax is payable of reverse charge under this act. Okay. So, uh, this provision, all the provisos in uh, erstwhile 38 were referring to rectification of errors or omissions. So, again, for the first time, if you are claiming this was not actually getting affected. Now, let us see how, what, is, what are the provisions of the new section 138. It says that the details of outward supplies furnished by a registered person under 37 or of such other supplies as may be prescribed and an auto-generated statement containing the details of ITC shall be made available electronically to the recipient. So your filing responsibility has been done away with. You will, what, what they are saying is that simply you will get an auto-generated statement. This statement shall consist of details of inward supplies of which credit of ITC may be available to the recipient. They're using the way a word may and not shall. So that means the onus has been passed on to us that we have to verify it again, whether all of such credit is eligible to you by, by some mismatch. It may also happen that the credit of some another vendor has been passed on to you in your 2B. So that doesn't mean that you have to take it. Details of supplies in respect of which such credit cannot be availed, whether wholly or partly by the recipient on account of the details of supplies being furnished under subsection 1 of section 37. Okay. Then by taking by any registered person within such period of taking the registration. So this is uh, specifically the amendment uh, uh, for the in-between period when you issue a supplementary invoice. Okay. So a registration a person has applied for registration. The effective date of registration is at a later stage. The supply is made in between period. They can amend the invoice and take the credit. So such uh, amendments will be accepted in your and get reflected in your 2B by a registered person who has defaulted in payment where such default has been continued for such period as may be prescribed or by registered person, the output tax payable by whom in accordance with the statement of outward supplies furnished by him during such period as may be prescribed exceeds the output tax paid by him during the said period by such limits as may be prescribed. So they will prescribe the limits wherein on your outward supply, the other, other person that is the recipient will have to pay the ITC. By any registered per huh, so okay. By any registered person, by any registered person who during such period as may be prescribed has availed a credit of ITC of an amount that exceeds the credit that can be availed by him in accordance with clause A by such limit as may be prescribed. Then again, by registered person who has defaulted in discharging his liability in accordance with the provisions of section 49.12 and by such other class of person as may be prescribed. So all together, section 38 is replacing your substantive right, which was provided in law to claim the credit or intimate about the claim of the credit to a auto-generated facility wherein the credits which are reflected either by the supplier or by the actions of the corrections of the supplier and any other person who is collecting tax and has been paying, including all your customs and all other authorities, that would be subjected to that particular uh, segment only. Section 39, provided that every registered person uh, furnishing under the proviso shall pay to government tax uh, due after taking into account of inward outward supply in such other manner 
may be provided now we know that uh, there is a provision of qrmt uh, wherein iff facility is been prescribed and the law allows you to pay the self assessed tax or the 35% of the liability so they are simply now bringing that in uh, the law for so many days it was uh, actually moving without a uh, uh, what do you say a force of law so they have brought this uh, this proviso has been substituted that every registered person furnishing return under proviso to subsection 1 shall pay to government in such form and manner and within such time as may be prescribed amount equal to tax due taking into account inward outward supplies of goods or service or both itc avail tax payable and such other particulars and in lieu of the amount referred to in clause a an amount determined in such manner and subject to such conditions and restrictions as may be prescribed again subsection 9 which was referring it to the section 37 and 38 They have removed it because thirty-seven, thirty-eight have been amended now, and thirty-eight has been removed totally. So where there are, the words are getting changed to where and uh, a conditions of satisfying the conditions of thirty-seven, thirty-eight are done away with. So where if registered person after furnishing return under one or two or three, four or five discovers any omission or incorrect particulars therein. Other than as a result of scrutiny, audit, inspection, or enforcement activity by tax, he shall rectify such omissions or incorrect particulars in such form and manner as may be prescribed, subject to the interest under this Act. No such rectification of any omission and or incorrect particulars shall be allowed after the due date for furnishing the return for the month of thirtieth day of November or the actual date of furnishing the relevant annual return. Just let me see some questions here. Okay. If dealer has claim credit which is not appearing on portal and not able to reverse it before September following that year, in such case, is it advisable to do it in annual return to stop? Again, this is uh, I will just take it later. uh if send if one sends goods on the returnable get pass from one side to other whether uh, i think uh, queries are coming beyond budget so i'll just take them at a later stage the effective date for implementation of budget amendments uh, say they will notify it uh, uh whenever all these sections are there so first thing the notification of finance act once the finance bill becomes the finance act then all the specific sections of the finance act 2022 will be first notified and then that will give powers to them so while implementing that they may implement straight away uh the what do you say uh the uh, amended notification and give a date else it will simply be form part of the law and the notification of that can happen at a later stage scrutiny notice under 61 of 1718 raise uh, i'll take that also later if supplier makes errors and shows bills in b2c instead of yes so again now uh, if we if we typically go, uh, go by 16 uh, 2 aa and 2 ab then today's date you may get Uh, uh you know you, you may be in a problem that uh, since it is not reflecting in your statement because the supplier has shown it in the b2c instead of b2b uh, it is a valid reason then yes that because it is been shown there uh, yeah, you won't get the credit but again as i said that the tax has already been discharged on this particular transaction now if you remember in our vat assessments uh, the officers would generally even ask for a balance confirmation from the supplier side now i really don't know how far they are going to take that in the gst law so if that system manages that uh, a particular credit which has been uh, paid by the uh, supplier in b2c he is for any particular reason not able to amend at that b2c and give you back the credit in your b2b okay then in that situation uh, on the basis of uh, uh, the invoice which you are holding on the basis of uh, the goods 
inward or the services inward whatever you are saying so accounting of services is also kind of service inward okay on the basis of say a confirmation from the supplier that he has paid that amount in uh, uh, the 3b in b2c with relation to b2c uh, or rather disclosed in one as b2c but amount has been discharged you can take a stand that no transaction can be taxed twice but this will not be without litigation this will go along with litigation availing reversing credit till it reflects in 2b won't it impact serial number 8b of gstr 9 since 8b of 2a since gets compared with so even if it is you are getting compared uh, uh where where is the point that uh you are doing any wrong so far you are taking the credit in time you are reversing it that is enough indication reversing it in your 3b right not in your books of account books of account you are reversing and passing it on in a control ledger if you are expensing it out then uh, the matter will get closed Th then your chance of reclaim will go away you cannot take the expenditure now and whenever it becomes available i will show it as income means that would be a more more of a aggressive stand you park it separately and this even if it is getting in your 8a and 8b reflected you can always show this explanation this reconciliation should not affect uh, the point that it is uh, 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 you are re uh, reversing the credit reversing the credit is a very clear indication that uh, they cannot invoke section 53 interest on you rcm liability discharge and claimed in same tax period so reflecting in 2b yes rcm uh, you can always claim in the same tax period only Okay, the rest all questions uh, I'll take in the end uh, post uh, this is been done. Okay, I think we have done this, right? Yeah, QMR MP we have done. Now, uh, one more thing, you know, this most of us, those who are there in service tax, uh, those who are practicing in service tax must be knowing this that whenever march comes even if you are having a balance in your credit ledger you would get a call from the assistant commissioner's office and uh, or uh, they would tell you that you will have to pay the credit do some amount in cash and all so from their point of view they have made a law that they have inserted a subsection 12 to section 49 wherein notwithstanding anything contained the government may on the recommendation of council subject to conditions and restriction specify maximum proportion of output liability under this act or under igst which may be discharged through electronic credit ledger by a person or a class of registered persons as may be prescribed so they may not bring this for everybody but for large uh, taxpayers unit they may bring in this applicability first wherein you may not be able although you are having all the eligibility credit but still say beyond 90 percent or beyond 95 percent you will not be allowed to pay the credit now, what would be the rationale behind this? Uh, one of the point is yes, or the very clear intent here is the uh, revenue collection, right? They want a safety in revenue. Further, uh, uh, ITC is per se, uh, you know, freely moving in the economy, but the cash economy or ITC is rather, you know, it, it, it is not finalized uh, uh till the time it is uh, uh, uh getting paid at the end stage because itc is moving at every stage for government to utilize the amount which is discharged through itc is little bit less so for there the actual funds which matter is actually the cash recovery so for that very purpose they may bring in some uh, conditions now what could be the rationale now if you say is it against the principles of the vat based law of free flow of credits so yes but government can always say that subject they will the conditions which they have mentioned they will mention that such credit may be realized so they will not bring these conditions for everybody they may bring it as uh, the class of persons may be large taxpayers unit they will release those factors like uh, uh, the conditions which were set out in the refund that after you submit your documents after your scrutiny has been done uh, we will start release, uh, releasing the credit and this is also one way that uh, there shouldn't be a free flow of the utilization of fake invoices because credits are being freely utilized. So this is the intent. So whenever this uh, things get challenged in the court of law, government will always propose that we have found so much of fake frauds which are based on uh, just the sale of invoices and all. 
and because of this uh, they have to have some restriction so that the entirety of the government revenue is not at stake but again as i said in the starting of the lecture i don't think more than 1% to 2% of the fake invoicing if you see the quantum at which the tax collection is happening and the frauds are being utilized uh, found uh if you see them in singularity you feel the amounts are bigger 3000 crores and 5000 crores and all but if you see in totality then that in the materiality aspect it is just 1 and 2% and for 1 and 2% uh, can we bring in such conditions and situations which will hamper the growth of the business in the longer run so that time will only uh, tell but yes they are making provision wherein they will mandate you to pay certain amount by cash ledger this specific time limit section 164 registered person shall not be entitled to take the credit so that they are shifting it to uh, 30th of november then 34 to any registered person who issues a credit note in relation to supply of goods or service both again uh, uh, credit note they have been shifting it to 30th of november 373 also they have changed that uh, rectification uh, will not be allowed beyond 30th of november uh, 399 also uh, no rectifications uh, uh, shall be allowed after the due date of furnishing uh, 30th day of november end of financial year to which it provides 52 uh, 6 again it is providing that no such rectification will be allowed beyond 30th day of november coming to 292 uh 292 is a person has a uh, paying tax under a composition scheme has not furnished returns for three consecutive periods uh, uh that was the condition here which was laid down so the composition schemes uh, this restrictive conditions has been changed for the cancellation so for purpose of cancellation uh, for composition uh, instead of three consecutive tax period they are uh, they will be comparing the return for the financial year beyond three months from the due date of furnishing said return like earlier if you do not file uh, the three returns three consecutive returns of composition uh, the taxable person was liable to be deregistered now they will wait for one full financial year and after the end of that one full financial year the return for that financial year should have should not be filed beyond 3 months from the due date of furnishing that return that is april's due date beyond that 3 months time would be allowed to you any registered person other than specified in clause b that is other than in composition if he has not filed for continuous period of 6 months uh, they have said continuous period as may be prescribed so let us see what is that uh, period which they are going to prescribe through rules so maybe they are keeping a leeway here with themselves that uh, they may start with 6 months or they may reduce it also they may increase the further time also depending upon uh, uh, how non compliant taxable people come ultimately all of this is based upon the data government is having huge number of data and on the basis of these data they are making so slowly they are shifting the executive powers of the parliament to automatically give the powers to the administrators and uh, making such sections so that uh, these uh, sections will give will empower the board to take necessary actions 53 i have already covered then for explanation to section 75 12 has been also added so uh, for the purpose of 73 74 or 39 as we have seen above uh, if any self assessed tax is remaining unpaid either wholly partly or amount of interest payable on such tax remains unpaid they can be recovered under the provisions of 79 and self assessed tax shall include tax payable in respect of details of outward supplies furnished under section 37 but not included in the return under 39 yeah this was regarding the budget and the recent amendments i will just now take this questions which are here i will go from below just want to confirm first time or may can be done after november of in yes you can do it but only thing uh, you will have to account it very very properly 
so the safest stand would be take the credit reverse it and keep it parked separately at times what happens you know and specifically these things happen when our due dates are postponed uh, uh, friends let us accept, accept the fact that most of the times we come to know a lot of things when we are doing the audits audits are also happening and tax audit due date is something which actually governs whether it is company law or anything but which actually governs the finalization of uh, the books of account so in such cases if uh, if things are being missed out if things are being missed out then in that situation uh, you will have to take care that they have been accounted properly so let the accounting happen properly once the accounting is done the safest stand is take the credit reverse the credit park it in a separate control account and claim it whenever it becomes available if not then yes but it is a stand which will be aggressive stand because you will have to literally fight on the words of the rectification of omission okay now which is omission in respect to what you have filed or omission in respect to what was there in your books of accounts the question is the interpretation of that so it is a aggressive stand again i am saying you will have to take care of that uh, itc restricted to the amount appearing to be with a will it mean that it will not apply to supply transactions uh see itc restricted to the amount of to be with effect from 1st january it will mean that the returns which are been filed post 1st january it will have a impact on that so that would be a better stand to be taken rather than assuming that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, in relation to the to be for uh, the previous period so that is what i would like to uh, take a stand on it is for all the returns which are filed beyond 1st of uh, january 2020 scrutiny in notice under 61 of 1718 and 1819 is raised by department regarding excess claim of itc as at a time 2a was not available it was not possible for taxpayer to reconcile and reverse the credit how to deal with scrutiny notice did the taxpayer should go for appeal or pay the tax so one question i would say uh, if it is 1718 and 1819 the two possible conditions which can be satisfied were only 162a and 162b and of course the fourth one in your hand right there is no question whether the other person files it in is to be whether the other person pays taxes on that you can very well fight but uh, the officers the, the audit parties also to that extent they openly say aapko tribunal ke pehle kuch nahi milne wala so you should have a mental preparation the client should have the litigation appetite to minimum go till the tribunal level the cost benefit analysis can be done accordingly and then you can decide whether to go in the appeal or go for uh, the scrutiny but this is very very clear that you will get the credit because section 38 was in force from day one of this act it is still in force it is not yet been retrospectively removed so so far you are not having your substantive right to disclose and say that this was my credit which is not appearing in this statement they do not have the right to reverse from it they will have to go and recover it from the supplier if one sends goods on returnable gate pass uh, from one on one side to other side whether gst is payable uh, returnable gate pass so do you want to say that this is on sale on approval savant sir is it is it sale on approval if it is sale on approval then it is fine that you will have you have the time period of 6 uh, months but if not then ultimately it is a supply okay what is the purpose of the goods being uh, sent from one side to another side right if you are saying capital goods that is a different aspect but if you are simply passing on your goods from uh, ha huh, now yeah, okay okay uh, i i got a question i am sorry i think you are saying that within the state it is not out, outside the state interstate it will be scheduled one transaction it will be uh, chargeable to tax within the state you can move your goods from one side to another uh, against the delivery chalan and all that should be fine there there should not be any gst on that because you are moving uh, goods from your own premises to other premises that is what i am assuming when you are referring to site both the sites uh, are the place where you are the supplier you are not working as a uh, uh, what do you say supplier to a third party 
uh, assuming that site is means both the sites are places where you are the supplier or you are doing the supply it is not that one site is of uh, x party the other side is of y party and you are simply moving the goods from here to there then that becomes a shift of goods from one place to another right because one person might have taken it in their works contract also so i don't have complete clarity you can put it as a question or uh, if they allow no okay there are uh, no means no was for uh, that no was for that uh, you asking about re uh, on returnable basis okay uh, approval sale or approval na approval okay uh, so i think the other side which i am uh, assuming is uh, basically uh, you have two sites single registration then gst shouldn't be applicable but if you are working as a subcontractor uh, and you are actually passing it on these goods to your contractor at one side and from there when you are shifting uh, you will have to go through whether you are having the uh, rights and controls there so uh, technically you will have to say uh, whether you have actually already passed on the goods uh, to your principal contractor in terms of your uh, supply if not you are simply having it as one side and taking it as other again wouldn't uh, matter for you as a gst liability it wouldn't be treated as supply if dealer has claim scrutiny is also i think i have answered right yeah if dealer has claimed credit which is not appearing on portal and not able to reverse it before i think this is also been done itc of 2021 not reversed in 3 till september 21 for non payment can we reverse the same in current 3b or discharge uh, see if you have a specific amount for any particular period i think uh, the reversal should better go through the drc 03 because that is easier for you to reconcile any any point of time the uh, gst or 3b is a simply a cluttered thing uh, they only don't know they typically brought this as a uh, uh, you can say uh, a payment chalan just to facilitate that the uh, because of the uh, faulty implementation of 1 and 2 government should not lose out on the revenue so they at least brought up kind of a payment chalan but the payment chalan was supported by some aspects of uh return and later on they agreed that no this is the return and you go through it so if you have not reversed it you can very well do the reversals i would suggest do it from uh, 3b if two go down in same state and gst chargeable what if why are you charging gst on the two go downs in the same state pay bill can go through uh, delivery chalan that shouldn't be an issue within the state scrutiny notice uh, yeah two way i think this pratik jakeli i have answered this question appeal we have received asmt 10 paying for a difference between itc 2a and 3b we have claimed less itc as compared to table 8a we explained us to no so uh, the stand which i have been taking is that i am disclosing all the invoices which we are claiming we are giving a summary of that second uh, as i said uh, doctrine of impossibility of performance for uh, section 16 to c has to be told to them there it has to be highlighted there are quite a few case laws also which states that the assessing authority has to apply its mind so the officer will have to apply its mind they cannot reject it outright they cannot reject it as non satisfactory you give the reference of section 38 you give the reference of section 16 to c and you give the proper invoices in hand okay if you are having a inward register show that you have actually received the goods and all after showing that if they are rejecting it i think uh, it would be not a easier case uh, to be stand uh, which can stand from the department side at a later stage in uh, commissioner appeals or at the uh, uh, gs stat uh, level okay but you can make sure you quote this case laws uh, for the fair Uh, assessments also because they have to follow that they, they will be bound once you put a case law in your uh, submissions the assessing officer the proper officer will have to be following a proper procedure they cannot give the replies of uh, simply not satisfactory not as per requirements and all they have to objectively uh, cross uh, objectively uh, do away with uh, uh, the questions uh, uh, with your submission for refund of gst paid on export of goods is there any amendment that such eligible goods 
or eligible class of person will be notified by department and all other will not be able to claim refund by payment of igst i am not aware of any such amendment where anybody who cannot use payment of igst method in fact government wants you to use i payment of igst method so that the tax is coming to them and they are refunding the tax in the question of igst uh, uh, itc method uh, they they are more prone to a lot of verifications and uh, they really do not have that much of bandwidth to go and verify your itc so i don't think uh, i am not aware sorry yes i think i answered the last question also this one scrutiny yes there is something in chat box also i have gave all purchases purchase so madam if you are given all purchase register don't worry uh, you have a good standing and uh, uh, there is absolutely no need to reverse your credit just make sure you have accounted it properly it is been claimed with your 3b's it is reflecting in your registers and you have a proper invoice and a purchase registers with you uh, to uh, uh, or uh, to prove that the goods and services have been actually been received by you so i don't think there should be any other uh, issue yes. thank you textiles they send goods to different job what can be the consequences and way out now see uh, itc 04 i have not been doing practically frankly i do not have any of the clients but uh, if we see the amendment they have made it quite easy also now so um, the practical thing is that you will have to be compliant with law they are as of now not invoking the any uh, what do you say they are not invoking any uh, i have at least not heard of any adverse actions but as we know that recently all of us must have received the notices for uh, even discharging the interest liability for 17 18 18 19 and 19 20 right yes, people have yes. filed late so whenever they are short of revenue they find everything which is possible and which is been left out that is the only answer i can say once a law is there it is our duty to get it complied if we feel that the law is unjust then we will have to fight it out and it has to be fought at uh, the judiciary level only there is or else maybe through a strong representations and majorly the representation should go from the industry because ultimately the industry is the one which is getting affected by that it is not the consultants in any which case yes thank you so much sir so this is the uh, benefit uh, we as organizer have that the speaker is not only the expert in gst but also tax savvy person so he could question read the question and answer himself only so so it was a energy saving for all the organizers right now <laughs> so uh, uh, so it was a wonderful session i mean we thoroughly enjoyed it because all the four people from our committee were sitting here they all practice in gst so we all were loving it listening to you and uh, uh, may i request uh, vijay sir uh, to propose a hearty vote of thanks to the learned speaker please good afternoon members it's my pleasant task to propose a well deserved vote of thanks to our speaker here gaurav save who has taken the today's session on impact of budget on gst and key amendments in a simple and lucid manner uh, gaurav we are indeed thankful to you for sharing your knowledge your deep and intellectual way of imparting knowledge has added the glory to the seminar today we also got a lot of information on impact of budget on gst and the key amendments which will truly help us in carrying out our professional work we have no words to offer gratitude for your valuable presence in this seminar you gave deep insight to, into the topics and revealed some of the interesting fact it was really an informative seminar in true sense i am pretty sure that the precious knowledge you gave us will definitely help us in our studies and future you really motivated us to gain more and more knowledge and work hard in our respective field you have also answered all the queries posted by the members gaurav we are indeed thankful to you for accepting your invitation and your presentation was very uh what do you call it? it's very uh, effective so on behalf of borivali central cp study circle i propose a well deserved vote of thanks and request the member to carry out with the virtual applause thank you thank you thank you so much gaurav thank you so much looking forward to listen to you again and again yeah thank you thank you thank you gaurav thank you thank you we will end the seminar right now yeah